John Hagee told me that. He referenced that. Revelation 16.9. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dave, you here with your Sunday go to meeting clothes on? <laughs> your Sunday go to meeting clothes. All right. We are back again, and I'm here to teach truth, but before we do, I want to uh, read some of our emails that people uh, uh, write to us from around the country and around the world. We get emails from all over because we are on TV from Los Angeles and San Diego all the way to New York, uh, a whole bunch of towns between like Chicago and St. Paul and Seattle and Des Moines and Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Beaumont, San Antonio, Austin, Waco, uh, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., a whole bunch of other. And we just went on in uh, Milwaukee and uh, we're on in Memphis and various other places. Uh, Abe Cook, he's from California. Hello, Jim. My name is 
A.B. Cook in California. I called and spoke to you yesterday to request a starter package, and while I'm waiting for that, I have a couple of questions. First, do you know, do you now or have you ever been a Mason? No. Or a fraternal member? No. Do the Masons, Mormons, Eastern Star, etc., I figure prominently in figure prominently in false prophecy and false doctrine. Well, no more than the Baptist churches. I mean, people are looking for Satanists and somebody who's drawing pentagrams. There's nothing more evil than a Baptist preacher or a Pentecostal preacher or a Church of Christ preacher that does not tell the truth. Nothing is more evil than that. We need to get that in our heads. Don't. Anton LaVey, who was pastor of the Church of Satan, and he wore his collar like Elvis. I mean, you know, like this, and going around going, ha, 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 and he had a widow's pick up here. That is a fairy tale. You might as well read, be reading Mickey Mouse. That's not going to deceive anybody. Uh, people who kill chickens and sit in the middle of a, of a pentagram in the middle of a room with a flame on each point, that... that in muttering some mantra, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't really actually lead people away. What really leads the sheep away is a preacher who's twisted the Word of God and he sounds good and he wears a three-peak suit. There's nothing more evil than a Billy Graham or a Kenneth Copeland. Nothing. If you remember, in the Old Testament, God constantly went after the preachers. In the New Jesus constantly went after the Pharisees. He never mentioned the prostitutes uh, at the temple of Aphrodite. He wasn't concerned with that. So he goes on to say, uh, uh, are, is the Masons figure prominently in false prophecy and false doctrine, or are they just another of the Balaam gods? They're just another. Also, is your series on prophecy in the stars available on DVD or audio? I don't remember where we DVD and back then, Mike. Yeah. Was that? Was that? It's available. They, huh? It's available. It's available. Okay. Fred says it's available. The prophecy in the stars. You mentioned such a series on the sermon. I was listening, but I couldn't find it in your archive sermons. Thank God for you, your staff, family and all who serve the church in truth, and may the peace of our Lord be with you always. Well, Abby, keep, keep on, brother. We love you. And then uh, Will Perry writes to us. He says, uh, hey, guys, what do you think about this quote by Spurgeon regarding man's will? And he quotes, uh, first he quotes Joshua twenty four fifteen. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he says, this was Spurgeon's quote. Let me clarify this. Mark that in the Father's drawing, in other words, when no man can come to me except my Father which has sent me, draw him, which means to drag in, elko is the word, there's no compulsion whatsoever. Christ never compelled any man to come to him against his will. Well, that's true in a sense. Uh, he has... He comes to us while we are unwilling, and he makes us willing. That's the thing. Uh, when people say, well, I knew I had a will to walk down an aisle or to pray a prayer or do something. The fact that you had the will meant you were already a believer because the Bible says in Psalms 115.3, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. So, he comes to an unwilling vessel of mercy while we're uh, depraved and in our sin and makes us willing. That's the point. He turns our will around to his righteous will. If a man be unwilling to be saved, Christ does not save him against his will. It's because he makes us willing. Uh, then he says, uh, what do you think of this? And then he comments, how does any free will how do how does any free will if God ordained predetermined everything from the beginning? Well, man doesn't have free will. He has when he does something righteous, he has God's will in him. That's when he's made willing. And he has nothing but self will before that. Self will is just going to sin. 
understanding these things are pretty tough. And he goes into some more Spurgeon stuff. But Spurgeon's right in that sense. He comes to an unwilling man and makes him willing. If a person's walking down an aisle, he's willing to do something, isn't he? And if he's truly a godly person, the, this is a good thing to stop and think about. I'm glad he wrote this. Because if you are sitting in the back of a church and you are willing, you're already a believer. Takes no walk down an aisle. Takes no prayer. Belief is the method of salvation. I, I, I like that. The fact that you're willing to believe God means God made you willing. When you heard the word somewhere along the way, you started becoming willing. And it wasn't your will, it was God's will. All right, then Celise Craig writes us, uh, Hello, Grace and Truth. I notice you have removed me from your mailing list. We don't remove people. If we don't hear from you in three or four or five months, uh, Tom and Mary go through the list and drop you. We've got to hear from you. Some people will take our DVDs and throw them in a shoebox in a closet for three or four years without looking at them. And if we don't hear from you, all you have to do, you want these DVDs free? All you have to do is look at one of the DVDs and look at the 800 number on there and call us and just say, keep me on your list. I'm so-and-so at such-and-such address. It's that simple. They're free. What else do you want? Stay in contact. It is fine. I know you haven't heard from me in a while. That's it. That's it. But I'm still in truth. Just have been accessing the web much. But I wanted to request a few videos, and she names them. Uh, still watching and studying from my older DVDs, but I'm interested in digging deeper in some of the most recent subjects posted. Thanks. Celise Craig, Craig in Providence, Rhode Island. We'll just keep her on the list right now. Just Celise, just call us. That's all it has to do. Email us. Or email. It doesn't take much. We just want to know that people are watching. Uh, Grant Posco from Australia writes to us. He watches us on the Internet over there. We're streaming live right now. We do every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and we're streaming 24 hours a day. Hello, I was watching 3092, and you mentioned Mount Sinai and distance. I've done a bit of looking into this and have discovered a reasonable amount of information. I've also looked at the distance and measured and done some research into how far people could travel by foot and other means. In them days, the distance to Mount Horeb in Saudi Arabia is about 400 kilometers. We don't know where Mount Horeb is. Nobody knows. If you read that from somebody, they're guessing. Nobody knows where Horeb is. Roman armies easily covered 50 kilometers a day on non-paved areas. Well, that may be a guesstimate. Anytime you see something on TV or on the Internet, uh, it's like that <laughs> commercial where they're talking about insurance. This, this guy and this girl are talking about insurance, and she says, I'm meeting my boyfriend, and... And the guy said, where'd you meet him? On the Internet. And the Internet will not lie. And up walks this guy, and she says, he's a French model. <laughs> hey, bonjour. <laughs> Looks like a bum. <laughs> the Internet will lie to you. It depends on who you're reading when you read a historian. You have to. Our final authority is the Bible, not this historian or this historian. If you'll notice, when you read McClinic and Strong, He'll say, Movers says so-and-so. Movers is a historian. Or he'll say, uh, Herodotus says such-and-such. Such. He's the father of history. Well, they may be wrong and they may be right. Our main source is Scripture. So don't believe everything you read. And it, some of these dates are just guesstimates. I have been in the military myself and done plenty of hiking and could cover 30 kilometers in six hours, carrying a minimum of 30 kilograms. If you are if you are up first thing in the morning and travel until sundown, even at a slow place, you can make 400 kilometers 
under 10 days. Another thing they have found in Sinai Peninsula is evidence of ancient roads so the area wasn't hospitable as people might think. The Egyptians had a number of mines in the area so they had transport routes. Well, there's much conjecture here, a lot of guessing. Uh, I'm not going to try to figure out where Mount Sinai was. I'm going to teach what we have in the Bible. I do know that two and a half million people walking with babies crying and little old ladies kind of hobbling along and an old man with their walkers or whatever they had uh, with some homemade crutch under their arm, they're not going to be moving fast. Anyway, so uh, John Wilkins writes, have you li ever listened to Ken Hovind? I don't remember. I've listened to so many guys on the Internet. Uh, and Anne Caffrey in Northern Ireland. Hello, Pastor Jim. Thank you for the DVDs. I have been handing out lots of tracts, mainly information about your, about your website. I have put information in local newspapers, Agape and Caffrey, County Meath, Ireland. She really cares. Lancy D'Souza from India. Dear brother, uh, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess you crossed out Jim or something. Thank you all for so much for the three DVDs. May the Lord richly bless you all. Love, Lancy in India. Uh, Evangelist Pascal Lanatio. Greetings to you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Jesus Christ is Savior and Lord. He is alive. And I guess that's all he had. I like the YouTube comments. I get various uh, strains of YouTube comments. Uh, my father is a Rastafarian. They've been referring to America and the Western system as Babylon since the 1950s. Well, they've got that right. Only problem is Africa's one of her daughters, and so is South America, and so is Russia because America was built up on a Babylonian concept of self, let us make us a name. We're just kind of like the head of the snake, you know. So I had a heads up to be cautious of putting America on a pedestal as a Christian nation. Well, it's absolutely not Christian. George Washington, Ben Franklin, and the boys were not Christians. They were self-avowed deists. They said so. Some politician go up and say, no, they weren't. And Jefferson is in his grave, grave is saying, yes, I, yes, I was. It's like, good grief. Why don't you believe the man when he said he was a deist? And then here's another YouTube comment. People know of Jesus because he became flesh. He is the word. God's proclaimed righteousness. Jesus always said the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, he said it there in Luke 17, 20, 1 and 22. The same goes for the Antichrist. <coughs> I wish people wouldn't use the term Antichrist. Antichrist is used only in First and Second John. That's the only place you find it in the Bible. And the Bible says anyone who denies Christ is Antichrist in First John 2, uh, 22. That only those who deny Christ are Antichrist. Deny, contradict, uh, if you don't believe in predestination, you're out of Christ. What they mean is man of sin. That's what they mean. The man who's head of the world ruling system. I realize that a lot of people, when they say the Antichrist this, the Antichrist that, they hadn't done much studying. Man of sin or other titles for him. For every truth that proceeds from God's mouth, the enemy creates a lie. Those lies create a system of thinking, believing, and doing. Babylonian system. Another YouTube comment uh, from Crux Dub on the name and the mark of the beast. I've been telling people this for the past three years. I don't remember when God revealed it to me, but I but I've my eyes have been open so wide since getting saved. Well, you have to learn something about that. You don't get saved. Saved is something God does to you, and being married. I've been telling people the Antichrist is not some man coming in the future. It's a system. Well, there will be a man ahead of the system. He's called the king of fierce countenance over there in Daniel 8. It's a system 
atmosphere, philosophy, and belief that goes against what Christ represents and taught. That's true. And then another one, B. Jones made this comment. Amen. The battle is the Lord's. Agape. Thanks for posting this. All righty. That'll be enough reading these. I've got a few letters. I'll read some of them tonight. Uh, Ricky Jenkins called, wanted to apologize. All righty. Uh, we forgive you. Vicki Clark from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, A.B. Cook. I talked to him the other day. He's single. He's disabled. He's 90 miles above Sacramento uh, in Oroville, California. And Clinton Derricks from Los Angeles, watching since January. And that'll be all the reading we need to do. I think that's be enough. All right. Uh, remember our regular announcements. We always announce uh, our TV all over Nashville area. We're on TV all over the country, but we just announced the Nashville, and we're on uh, Hendersonville Channel 3 and uh, radio every Saturday morning, WNQM 1300 on the dial. Uh, we, we also try to help our needy people. I, I've got a lot of people that are just trying to stay alive, and they're having a hard time. And we got about 10 people we give to regularly, either gift cards or money each month. And we got about 20, another extra 10 that we give sporadically. And we'd like to, uh, uh, if you want to be a part of this helping the needy, that is our obligation. Some of these people can't help it. They've, they don't have a lot of get up and go, and they're not able. Some of them are widow ladies that are disabled. Some have been injured and just have a difficult time coming along. You want to help them, uh, they're believers. We only help believers. We don't help everybody. Just people who believe these truths, that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, not going to go into preaching a message on it. So you want to help them, you can send, you can send a check or you can send gift cards. And uh, you can get a, you can make the check out to grace and truth and put for the needy on the bottom of it. And 100% of that and more, we'd even take more than what you send to help the needy. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody here. Do we have any visitors? Don't think we have any visitors that's never been here, do we? Nope. It's good to see everybody, though. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. I'm glad you said Jim Brown in the prayer because God would have not have known which Jim you were talking about. Dave is funny. He, I used to, he used to call me from Dallas. And he'd say, Mr. Brown. And I'd say, don't call me Mr. Brown. And he'd call me back and say, Mr. Brown. <laughs> and well, Dave is funny because when he gets through, he's through. He'd say, I want to tell you, doesn't he? <laughs> when he gets through, he doesn't say goodbye. He says, I saw this guy, and he said this, click. That's all he want, wants you to know. He doesn't say bye. <laughs> I'm through here. <laughs> If he'd say I'm through, you're very funny sometimes. <laughs> he is funny. He reminds me, sometimes he says things so funny. Reminds me of that comedian who talks like this all the time. Huh? Your mother told you, and he'll say something. And I'll start laughing. He wants to know what I'm laughing Without the truth, I wouldn't want to live in this world. I just wouldn't want to be here. That's our purpose, to have truth.
It's Sunday morning. We have been studying prophecy, and it's very unusual all the directions that it takes you into. It took us into tongues, and uh, prophecy has to do with one situation in the Bible, and it lasted for about 800 years, and that was, it was Israel's kingdom. Israel was a kingdom uh, for about 800 years, approximately. We don't know exactly, but that's an approximate. They were under judges somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 to 300 years, 300 years. And that started with Joshua and ended with the last judge, which was Samuel. Before him was Samson, and you had all these others, uh, Jephthah and Gideon and Ehud and so forth. And everything in prophecy, everything has to do with the fact that Israel was a kingdom being ruled by kings and judges, by kings and judges. And Israel had all of these kings right here. And everything in prophecy is due to what these guys did. That's all it's about. And, of course, when Israel, this land of Israel, this was given to Abraham. If this is Israel, and this is the Mediterranean Sea, and here's Egypt down here, and here's the Sinai Peninsula, and this is Babylon over here, Babylon. Uh, that would be on, that would be, this is a little map. We're going to get that other one hung before long. But if Israel's over here, Babylon's over here. And here is mileage chart right here. About the, end, about the length of my finger is 200 miles. 200, 200, another 200 down here to Babylon is about 600 miles from Israel. You have to go north in that green area. That's where they can travel. The brown or tan area is desert, so they couldn't crow across here. So Abraham, God comes to Abraham. He comes out of the lineage of Shem. Shem is the second born of Noah. And in, when they go into the ark, they land on Mount Ararat. This is a chain of mountains in eastern Turkey. And the descendants of Ham, which is the third born of Noah, they migrated into the Egyptian Ethiopian area down here. This is the black race. And the Japheth, the sons of Japheth, migrated up here into the area of what we call Armenia or Georgia between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Directly up above, uh, as you go between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, here's Israel, Syria, Iraq, Iran. This was, Iran was Persia in the ancient world. Iraq was Babylon. This is Iraq right here. That was the approximate area of Babylon. And the, when Japheth went up here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, this is the Caucasus Mountains, and this was the Caucasian race. Well, the, or that was the Gog, land of Gog, and they uh, hardened the, it comes from the word Gog, comes from Ko, Ka, Ka, and they hardened the, the K, G, O, G. And they called their mountains uh, Gog, the land of Gog, or it was uh, Magog, and the highest points they call Gog, and they named their leaders after the highest mountains. So you go straight up there, and then you go into Russia. That's why when Assyria, the Assyrians are the people of this area up here. Assyria is actually northern Babylon. So when northern Israel is carried away by the Assyrians, they're carried off up here, into this Georgia Armenia area and directly above that is Russia that's why so many of the Jews uh, migrated back on this homeland pilgrimage from Russia when Israel became a nation in 1948 but they, they had that permission to come into Israel well the descendants of Abraham came from this land of Ararat 
And they, they came down here, or the ancestors of the Jews came down and migrated into the Babylon area. And this is where Abraham is when God comes to him in Genesis, the 12th chapter, and says, Get thee up out of thy country and from thy kindred unto a land that I will show thee. And he travels this direction till he gets over here to the land of what we call Israel. It was called the land of Canaan back then. So that's where Abraham comes from. And that's why God called him down here was to give him this land right here. And he says, I'm going to give you this land and to your descendants. Well, that's Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. And then God changes Jacob's names to Israel in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. Israel. And then his 12 sons become the nation, and each one of them has a tribe. And when they come back to inherit the land, Joshua, it was Joshua's job in the book of Joshua to divide the land up into uh, where God tells him to divide it. So all the 12 sons of Jacob, Reuben, Judah, Benjamin, Dan, Ephraim, uh, which is the second born of Joseph. Joseph's tribe was divided into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, and uh, then Gad, and then here's uh, Issachar, Zebulon, Asher, and Naphtali. So that's the way it was divided up. And God tells Israel, I've given you this land. When I called your father Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, the Chaldees was Babylon. When I called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, I gave you this land. I'm going to be your God. You're going to be my people. I have chosen you. You didn't choose me. So he gives them the land. And he says, and there's a condition on this. The land will bring forth crops. And it will bring forth all the crops you're going to need. But you, in order to do this, you're going to have to let the land lie rest every seven years. And that's a sabbatical year sabbatical year and if you're going to keep sabbath you need to keep the sabbatical year and not work all year long okay if you're going to keep the biblical sabbaths and so god tells israel when he brings them out of they go 400 years into they go 400 years in e in egypt when joseph is sold in egypt when Joseph is sold in Egypt, his 12th son. And then they're 400 years in Egypt and then 40 years in the wilderness. And then they come back and they possess the land and they're under judges. Well, God puts them under judges because they don't drive the old pagans out of the land and they start intermarrying with them. And God says, I've told Moses that if you don't Obey me, I'm going to send four judgments. The sword, that your enemy will come against you, and they'll win all their battles. And you'll flee seven ways, and they'll come against you one way. And I'll send famine, and that will be uh, like uh, Elijah there in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, uh, how that God will, he sent Elijah in the, in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. In the 16th chapter, Ahab goes after Baal in the grove, and God sends no rain in that, in that 17th chapter of First Kings. And he says, I'll send pestilence. And he sends all kinds of disease. And he says, as a last resort, I will send the beast. And that will be Babylon. And northern Babylon was Assyria. And they carried, they carried northern Israel away into captivity because... They kept going after Baal and the grove and Shemash and Molech and Ashtaroth and Isis and, and, uh, and Moloch and Milcom and Malcolm and all these sun gods of all the people around them. And God scatters northern Israel and southern Judah by Assyria and by Babylon. And Babylon is overthrown by the Persian Empire and they're overthrown by Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire. And Greece is the leopard Persia is the bear, and that's why they're called the beast, and Babylon is the lion there in Daniel 7 and, he's in Revelation 13. And also Hosea 13, you'll see the lion, bear, and leopard there. Oh, you'll also see the lion, bear, and leopard in Isaiah 11, and we need to stop there and keep going because you, that's the beast carrying Israel away into captivity. 
And while they're in Greece, Alexander the Great gives Israel all of its glossa, which means foreign language and dialects. And you had many different kinds of foreign languages that were not Greek language. Many of them. You had Latin, which wasn't a Greek language. You had the language of the Franks, which we call French now. You had the language of the of the Spaniards or the ancient Spaniards. But the dialects was a dialect of the Greek language. Every city had those dialects. And we're not going to go through this completely. We've already done about two months on tongues on Sunday morning. It has nothing to do with the Pentecostal tongues. I love Pentecost. I hate Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism is a godless, evil wickedness. There's no such thing as Pentecostal tongues. There is no such thing as faith healing. God heals who he wills to heal, but there's no such thing as faith healing. There's no such thing as, as slain in the spirit. And all this imagination that the Pentecostals have going on, I believe that's one of the most wicked uh, systems of religion that's in the world today. And it's running rapid throughout the world. And the charismatics are, they say that God wants everybody rich and you can be a, you can be a uh, Baptist or a Catholic and be a charismatic and be brothers. And yet you believe you're saved two different ways. The Catholics by eating Jesus and the Baptists by accepting Christ. But I forgot that's the same thing, isn't it? Accepting Christ is walking down the aisle in the Catholic Church and accepting the Eucharist, and they said Jesus was present in that. Now, we've gone through this, and the tongues is a result of Israel being scattered. Now, you know what amazes me? Most people don't even know that in the Old Testament, from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, that everything that's about prophecy is about what Israel did during this time period right here. Everything that Israel was looking forward to in the lineage of Abraham, which goes back to Adam through Noah and his son Shem, everything was looking forward to a promised Messiah. That promise was given in Genesis 3.15. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is a picture of Christ the Messiah coming and subduing the man of sin, not not just at the end of time. Certainly he will come back and he'll destroy the man of sin at the end of time. Most people try to call him Antichrist. Well, he is Antichrist, but so are you when you contradict Christ. The Bible says he that denieth Christ is Antichrist. Deny is the word arneomai, and it means to contradict. If you, don't, if you don't believe what God says, you're contradicting his word, and you can't do that and be a believer. If you don't believe in predestination, what you're doing is you're contradicting God and you're instructing God about what he meant, and you can't do that. Now, it amazes me that most people don't even know that Israel was a nation or a kingdom under kings from Saul to Zedekiah, and most people don't know that they were scattered all over the earth by the Assyrians and Babylonians, and then the Persians ruled them, and then the Greeks ruled them, and then Rome ruled them, and then the old Roman Empire, the fire worship of the Roman Empire was outlawed. It was reinstituted in the form of Roman Catholicism. So the beast wouldn't be just Roman Catholicism. It would be a Babylonian system of self, because Babylon, Babylon began back here in Genesis 11, 4, when they said, let us make us a name. When they said, let us make us a name, let us make up our own authority, and they started imagining all this fire and tree worship, Hercules and Venus and Shemash and Molech and Jupiter, and they deified all these gods in the stars. So it amazes me that people don't even know anything about Israel as a kingdom and that they were scattered and that the reason God called the Gentile church... And he has a predestinated elect among the Gentiles. And the reason he did that was because Israel kept uh, being blind to God and kept serving other gods. So God says, I'll blind you. And Jesus says that in the 19th chapter of, of Luke when he comes into the city and up on the young colt of an ass. And he's there to be crowned king and they crucify him as the Passover lamb. 
and they're blinded, and we're going to go into the 70 weeks of Daniel that have to do the, with this. We're going to teach on the 70 weeks thoroughly. I'm going to try to do more thoroughness on this 70 weeks. This tongue series is the most thorough that I've ever done. I've never done one this complete. I've done some pretty complete, but not as much as we've done this time. Now, and of course, at the end of time, the Jews will come back and May 14th, 1948, 1948, they became a nation for the first time since they were carried away by Nebuchadnezzar back here in 586. But you see, they had been ruled and abused by the world. Six million of them were killed during World War II. And this was the final judgment of God, six million, by a, by a Gentile uh, Caucasian by the name of, and he was an Assyrian by the name of Adolf Hitler. He was an Assyrian, and that's the final judgment on the literal Jew. Now, they're not going to go to heaven because they're literal Jews. They're going to have to join us in the church. There is, a, uh, there is spiritual Israel, and there is literal Israel. Literal Israel doesn't get to go. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. The election hath obtained this, and the rest were blinded. So, and we'll get into all of that in the prophecy series. Where we are, we are, we have gone through Acts 2, and may I remind you that when Moses comes out of Egypt after 400 years and brings Israel out of Egypt, and God says, I'm going to bring these four judgments, he's, uh, gosh, I got my mind on so many things. Uh, I was going to say something. Y'all have to excuse me. Now, huh? Senior moment. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. If you got as many things on your mind as I do. Now, we were talking, we've been talking about in Acts 2. Oh, yes. When he gives him these laws to come out, he gives him three feasts that all the males are required to come back to. So you have to connect the three feasts with the fact that they've been scattered all over the earth. So here they are, scattered all over the earth, and all the males have to come back to Israel. They've got to come back to Jerusalem for Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Ingathering, which is the same thing as Feast of Huts or Feast of Tabernacles. And in that seventh month is the Day of Atonement. So all the males have to come back to Jerusalem. But since they've been scattered for 500 years, by the time nearly 600, since we, when we get to Acts 2, Acts 2, and they have to be coming back every year, and they've been frustrated for hundreds of years because they come back, and by the time they've been scattered for hundreds of years, most of them don't speak any Hebrew anymore because the rabbis have deified the Hebrew language and made it a holy language that's used only by scholars and students uh, are these authorities like the scribes and the Pharisees. So when they come back, they can't even understand each other when they're trying to worship God with all of these feasts because they all speak a different language or they all speak a different dialect of the Greek koine. And these dialects, as I've said hundreds of times, they differ as much as Spanish and Italian in our day and time. Just because you can speak one dialect, you can speak another. So when the Lord tells the apostles, who were just ignorant men from northern Galilee, and they're from this little Galilean area, one of the apostles was a Pharisee from southern Judah, and that was Judas. Judas was a Pharisee. His father was Simon the Pharisee. And he was a Pharisee by inheritance. If your father was a Pharisee, you became a Pharisee. So... All these 12 apostles in northern Israel, and God tells them, go into all the world and teach all nations in their dialects and in their gloss of their foreign languages. Well, do you think 12 ignorant fishermen, uh, 12 counting Matthias, who took the place of Judas, do you think these 12 ignorant fishermen can go over here and speak Spanish and French and all the dialects of the uh, Greek? No. God had to give them a miracle. So they said in Acts 2, these were Jews from every nation under heaven, and they said, how hear we every man, hear every man in our own dialect, wherein we were born. 
and our own dialectos, D-I-A, that is the word in the, in the text, it's receptus in the Greek Bible, and you've got it right, I've got a text of receptus over here somewhere, that's the Greek Bible, you can get an interlinear Bible, it has the, has the Greek on the top line, and it'll have the English right under it. And they said, how here we every man in our own dialect. These are Jews from every nation because they have been required to come back by this law of Moses. You've got to come back to these three feasts. And they're coming from all over the world. And they all spoke with other tongues, heteroglossa. Heteroglossa, that has nothing to do with Pentecostals. It means other, a heterosexual is other sex, other glossa, other foreign languages. We got our word glossary from that word glossa. That's a section of a book of words that are foreign to the average reader. Now, where we are, we have, we've gone through all of this, and, and we've, we're over here in Acts, uh, not Acts, in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, and we're going to try to finish up this chapter. Go to 1 Corinthians, 14th chapter. How much time did I take up giving y'all that review? Huh? 72 minutes. All right. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. And you say, Jim, why do you do that to us each time? You're not the only people here. I've got this microphone on. Which side is it on? Here. Got this microphone right here. And there's a camera, and this may be the first time some people are hearing this. And I want them to know what this is about. And some of you here are not here all the time, and you may have missed a lot of this. This is too much. This is like going into an algebra class and say, we're going to take up where we left off last week, and I'm not going to review anything. And everybody will be lost. Let me get me a drink, drink, D-R-A-N-K, drink of water. I've had people complain because I will use incorrect English. I do that on purpose to kind of put people in their place. If you think I don't know anything, listen a while. Uh, I don't like this uppity attitude that people have about <coughs> condescending to the common man. Jesus said, I came to preach the gospel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me for what? The Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the toka, the tokas, the emptied out. That's not usually people that have a real extensive vocabulary. Uh, I came to preach the gospel to the brokenhearted and the bruised. That's usually the downtrodden. So let's connect with each other. And it doesn't matter to me how you pronounce a word, if you, how you spell it, as so long as you can learn the truth. That's the main thing. Now, we're over here in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. We've already said that at Corinth, at Corinth they had, they had, only God knows how many dialects, dozens and dozens and dozens. That was the hub of the world. It was the hub of world trade. It was the hub of, in the first century, of, of every kind of debaucherous, lascivious act of idolatry that you can possibly think of. They had all of those gods. They had temple prostitutes at the temple of Aphrodite. They had... Uh, uh, they were offering sacrifices daily to these gods. They, these were the sailors were coming through there. The merchants were coming through there. That was on, just on the very bottom of that land bridge on the northwestern section of the land bridge that comes over to this Peloponnesus, the thing that's shaped like a hand. All of this is Greece. Upper Greece was called Macedon. That was like northern Israel. Upper Greece was where was the old hard-nosed, ignorant, redneck Greeks lived. You had to be, that was like living in Mississippi. That's like northern Israel. <laughs> it was. It was like northern Israel. The Samaritans considered northern Israel a bunch of just ignorant dirt farmers. They called them Amharets, which meant uh, people of the soil. Well, that's what northern Israel was. What's amazing is Alexander the Great was from Macedon. He was from north, no, uh, northern Greece. He was from northern Greece. So he was kind of a considered a red, even but he was a homosexual. He did have a boyfriend he took to all of his fights with him when he would go out on his campaigns. Now that Corinth was there. They would, the world trade, sailors from every nation was there. 
That's why Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 14, don't come in the church. If you come in the church, I don't want anybody speaking in an unknown tongue. He said, if you speak in an unknown glossa, foreign language, all you're doing is edifying yourself. And God never, ever says edify yourself anywhere in the scriptures. Edify the church. Oikodomeo, O-I-K-O-D-O-M-E-O. That is the word edify. It means to build up, build up the house of God. And domeo is our word dome. It means roof, roof. And oikos is the word house or family, house or family. Uh, in fact, if you see that oikos yogurt, have you seen that? That's a Greek word. That's a, that means family yogurt or house yogurt. So it's amazing how you can see Greek everywhere in our society. I've told y'all, I always notice it everywhere. I was watching the agony and the ecstasy one time, and that's a movie about Charlton Elvis Heston, you know, by the Lord God, let my people go. Uh, Oh, it's funny cause, because Moses had a thick tongue. He couldn't hardly talk. And Charlton Heston's always going, By the Lord God, let my people go, Pharaoh. Moses couldn't talk. Aaron had to talk for him. He stuttered. He had a thick tongue. How stupid. But anyway, Charlton Heston was playing Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo. Playing him in the movie Agony, Agony and Ecstasy, how he's painting the Sistine Chapel. And when it come on there, it says, The Agony and the Ecstasy, it's that agonizomai and ecstasis. It's everywhere in our society. Agonizomai, the agon, there's the agon. The agony, that's a Greek word. Ek means out, stasis means to stand out or outstanding. The Agony and Ecstasy. Well, you got it everywhere. Now, where was I? Where was I? All right. We're over here in the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And what we're doing is we're going through this. There's two particularly important chapters on tongues. Acts 2, which we've covered thoroughly, and 1 Corinthians 14. And Paul is here at, the, at Corinth. And he is saying, we've got all kinds of languages out here. We got all kinds of gloss, all kinds of dialects, and I don't want anybody coming in the church and speaking in an unknown tongue. If you speak in an unknown tongue, you edify. Oh, I was talking about oiko domeo. Uh, you are, you're building up yourself. That is a condemnation to edify self. That is not commending anybody. And of course, he says that when he's saying he that speaketh in an unknown tongue in verse four edifies himself. That's like condemning a man when he says that. And, of course, the Pentecostals say he edifies himself. He lifts himself up. And isn't that wonderful? Everybody looks up to him and they have no idea what he's saying. Then he says all down through here, I want to hear words that are easily understood in verse 9. He says, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound in verse 8, he says, who will know how to prepare himself to battle? You can't just start tooting a trumpet and playing anything you want to play. Play some jazz song or play... Uh, you can't play taps at that time, or you got to play. You got to get the men up and play reveille and give then give the charge. Da, 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 That's how you know it's time to go to battle. He says, "I want the words of God to be understood." And then he goes on and talks about. I better say something about this again because the Pentecostals really they don't know what they're doing when they'll read verse thirteen and fourteen. Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue. If you notice, unknown every time is in italics. That means it's been inserted by the translators. It was not in the original text. It actually says, he that speaketh in a glossa, a foreign language, in the church, coming out of the streets of Corinth, pray that you may interpret. Of course, it, you have to interpret out of that language into the language of that church. They're speaking a language. They're speaking a dialect. Every city-state had a dialect. They've got one at Corinth of the Greek, uh, of the Greek koine. So 
he's saying, when anybody comes in, make sure there's somebody in the church that knows not only the language of this man, and if this man is going to say something in the church, he needs to find out if anybody in his in the church can speak the French or the old ancient French where he comes from and can translate it over to that dialect in the Corinthian church. That's what he's saying. Then he goes on to say, now they'll talk about a prayer language. <laughs> and they use this verse 14 to talk about it. For if I pray in a not unknown, in a foreign language, a glossa. The word dialect is not in this chapter. But when Paul says, I want things to be understood, whatever dialect they're speaking in that church, it has to be translated from whatever language that man is from, or whatever country he's from, into the dialect of that church. But my under he says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. Remember, prayer is bowing to the will of God. He says, my breath is praying. It, when we speak, it's our breath traveling over our vocal cords. So he's saying, uh, my spirit is just praying. I'm praying, but my understanding, notice my, that's a possessive pronoun. He says, I have a understanding of what I'm saying. It's not fruitful to the people in the church. It's not a prayer language. That's goofy. It's not what he's saying. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with understanding also. I'm going to pray where the people in the church can understand what I'm saying. Have somebody here pray in Spanish. It's going to do no good for anybody else here. You can do that to yourself without praying out loud. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. Else when thou hast bl shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room with the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, and sing he understandeth not what he saith. Then he goes on down here, and he says, in verse, and we will go back and cover this. What I'm trying to do is finish up all the teachings on tongues. It won't completely finish it all. But it will, I'm trying to give you an overall understanding of all the difficulties that people find in uh, the scriptures about gloss and dialects. It has, you got to dismiss every Pentecostal notion that you've ever seen or heard of. When I say Pentecostal, that is the, anything that's Pentecostal believes in speaking in tongues, but not the biblical speaking in tongues. They believe in making up words like little kids in a sand pile. They're saying, And it sounds silly. And it is silly. And they'll talk, and most of you have either done it or been there, haven't you? Some of you haven't. You'd have to be there, and they do it every service, and it's disgusting. I've had a lot of experience in that. I've traveled in Pentecostal churches. Assemblies of God are Pentecostal. Pentecostal holiness, these are all different denominations. Apostolics, United Pentecostal, and you've got dozens and dozens of other Pentecostal churches, and they all jump up and speak in tongues. If Pentecostal tongues were true, they're even still doing it wrong because the Bible says only do it by twos or threes. It's, it's saying don't speak in Pentecostal tongues by twos and threes. Speak in glossa by twos and threes. Take people over to the side and let one interpret to these guys that can't understand the language of this church. Take them over to the side in gloss and dialects and do it by twos and threes at the most. So if they're doing it on TV or in a crowd where they've got 30,000 people like on a Joyce Myers party crusade or, or that one of those Pentecostal carnivals that they have, they're doing it wrong. If they were right, they're wrong. Even if they were right, they're still wrong, aren't they? Then he says, I thank God I speak with glossum more than you all in verse 18. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice, I might teach others also that in 10,000 words in a glossa, it just doesn't say unknown. It says 
than to speak 10,000 words in a language that nobody understands. Then he says in verse 21, in the law it is written. So he's going to connect what Paul is going to do. He's going to connect the glossa that's being spoken at Corinth with something over here in the law that was given to Moses. So the law that was given to Moses is going to have something or the... Now, let me just say this. The law, according to the Jews, was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They call that Torah, T-O-R-A-H. We call it Pentateuch, coming from Pent, meaning five, five, first five books. Uh, the law was also called the rest of the Old Testament. It's many times it, it is referred to as the law. When Paul says here, in the law it is written, with men of other glossa. Let me write this down. Let me erase all this. I want you to see this clearly because when you talk to Pentecostals, does most of you, have you talked to Pentecostals? You've been Pentecostal, haven't you? A lot of you have been. You're going to need to know what this means. It doesn't mean what they are saying. And you know that Pentecostals think that they're just a couple of steps higher than the other Protestants in America. Do you know that, don't you? They think they're up here and you're, they're a believer up here. They believe that tongues is a second work of grace. That you, after you get saved, then you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that he that hath not the Spirit of Christ is none of his. We are, we ha every one of us have the Spirit of Christ when we're born again. And that's when we receive the Spirit, or the breath of God. The word Spirit is breath. Now, he says, with men of other tongues, let me put it real simple, with men of other glossa, tongues, glossa. He is saying, this is written over in the law or in the book of Isaiah. So whatever, whatever Isaiah says about this tongue, that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 14, right? With men of other tongues will I speak unto this people, and for all that they will not hear me. He's saying, I'm going to tell you in Isaiah, the 28th chapter, of how that God says, I'll talk to unbelieving Israel. I'll talk to unbelieving Israel with these other tongues in Israel in the book of Isaiah. Now, whatever the word tongue is in Isaiah 28, where this is quoted from, is going to be equal. Isaiah 28 tongue equals 1 Corinthians 14 tongue. Right? You understand what I just said? This tongue over here is going to be equal to this, isn't it? He says, with men of other tongues, what I speak to these people. Let's go back. Well, let me read the next verse and let's go over there. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Tongues, tongues, because I'm going to speak to my people, unbelieving Israel. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. Tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe not to believers, but to them that believe not. Now, we've already said that unbelieving Pharisees come to Jesus, and they said, give us a sign, Pharisees. And that's because the Jews always got signs in the Old Testament, a cloud by day and a fire by night, and the shoes didn't wear out, and their feet didn't swell up, and... Uh, and uh, 
all the miracles that led him out of Egypt, all the ten plagues and Pharaoh's heart softened. And you can name signs over and over again. They always got signs. The Jews seek a sign. The Greeks seek wisdom. They said, give us a sign. Jesus said, no sign, but the sign of the prophet Jonah, that he was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, and then resurrection. So resurrection is the sign of Jonah. And resurrection is the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's the gospel. So the tongues will be to preach the gospel to the Gentile elect church, church, Gentile church, which is the all flesh. Tongues are for a sign, and God's going to pour out of his spirit on all flesh, and that is red, yellow, black, white, black, and brown flesh. Not every man. Not every man. Now, to those that believe not. So let's go back here and read Isaiah 28. We're going to have to see what's going on with Isaiah 28. This is where you're going to find out what this is talking about. This is Isaiah. It's just like I said. When, when Luke, the third chapter, John comes preaching the baptism of repentance as it was written in the book of Isaiah. So the baptism of repentance is found in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the third verse which is prepare you the way of the Lord. Mark 1, verse 1, says the beginning of the gospel, and it goes on to say in verse 2, is prepare you the way of the Lord. So, gospel is the baptism of repentance, and was all preached in Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. So if you start studying baptism, any later than Isaiah 40 and 3, you've started too late, haven't you? There's one baptism, it's not water, it's blood. Now, I know Jesus was washed in water, and that's proselyte baptism. Not going to go there right now. All right. Now, let's go to Isaiah 28. So, in Isaiah 28, let's go to the verse that this is quoted from. Look at verse 11. With, for with stammering lips and another tongue. In other words, stammering is the word laeg. L-A-E-G. It means foreign. Oh, wait a minute. I think that's the same meaning as the word tongue in Isaiah 14, isn't it? Uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Same thing, isn't it? With a foreign language and another tongue, Lashon, L-A-S-H-O-W-N, L-A-S-H-O-W-N. Lashon means language. So what he does, he just verifies with a second, with a second witness what laeg means. With another foreign language. Well, I speak to this people Israel. Well, they're unbelieving. Isaiah's whole prophecy is about God calling the Gentiles to be his people. That's what his whole message is. But how are we going to understand what this is talking about? Stammering la egg. How did he talk to northern Israel that Isaiah is prophesying to? He talked to them with the Assyrians. He says, you haven't listened to me for hundreds of years, so I will take my belt off and I will whip you with my belt and that will be the Assyrians empire and I'm going to have them come in and the Assyrians spoke a Chaldean language. A Chaldean language. Now whenever you take your concordance and you open it up in the Hebrew dictionary in the back the Hebrew dictionary it says it doesn't say it on the top of this page. But it says on most of your dictionaries, it says Hebrew Chalde lexicon. Lexicon is just a word that means dictionary. So it'll say Hebrew Chalde. There it is. Well, it says Aramaic here. Aramaic was the, it'll say Chaldean most of them. Most of y'all says Chaldean, doesn't it? Chaldean was a Babylonian language 
and it is kin to Aramaic, and it is a an Assyrian language. But it it's similar to the Hebrew language, but it sounds like a stuttering or a stammering. Now, what God is saying, when I call the Assyrians down here to carry northern Israel into captivity, you're going to hear them come in in their chariots with whips and with swords and those horses on their chariots and with those scythes on them, uh, those, those uh, blades on the wheels to come in and cut you down. And you'll, you're going to listen to me. And they didn't even listen to that. He said, with men of other tongues, stammering tongues. And the Chaldean language sounded like a stuttering sound of the Hebrew. And it sounded like they were, as they were running over their chariots, it was a stuttering sound. It's, they could hear the Hebrew in their language. And God says, I'll talk to you with men of other tongues and other lips. But you're not going to understand this unless we back up to the first part of the chapter. And you're not going to understand this fully unless you read the whole book of Isaiah and understand that he's prophesying the downfall of northern Israel. And he's speaking of in the future God calling the Gentiles to the light and calling them out of the prison house, which the Gentiles were the spirits in prison or the spirits in darkness. Now, let's back up to the first part of the chapter. We know he's talking to northern Israel by what he says in the first verse of this chapter. We're still talking about tongues. Can you get that? Still talking about the tongues because Paul refers to this chapter. That sounds just like the words of Paul, doesn't it? With men of stammering lips and another tongue, will I speak to this people? They won't hear me. He's talking about the chariots of the Assyrians and the armies coming in to slaughter northern Israel in from for about 10 years, from 732 to 722. He called in the, uh, there in Second Kings, you can read about the different kings, Shalmaneser, he brought in Sennacherib. Before that, he brought in tiglath pileser These were the kings of the Assyrians slaughtering Israel because they didn't go. And it was all because Israel, while they were a nation, went after Shemash, Bolek, uh, the Ashtaroth, Baal, and Grove. Because Israel kept going after these gods, that's what the tongues has to do with. God slaughters them, and he's going to call another people, the Gentile church, and the tongues are for the Gentiles who believe not. It's for them, so they can hear and believe. But it's for a Gentile elect church, a predestinated family that God has ordained. Now, let's read here in verse 28. Chapter 28, verse 1. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim is northern Israel. That's because in Genesis 48, uh, Jacob blesses Ephraim over Manasseh. He's second born of Joseph. So Joseph receives the inheritance of Israel. Joseph receives the inheritance and it's given to his second born son Ephraim. And that's a picture of the second birth or a picture of Abel over Cain or and all these second borns all through the Old Testament. So he's saying Ephraim gets northern Israel. Well, how was it that, is, that Ephraim, northern Israel, was drunkards? A drunkenness was a mixture of, of truth and a lie. A mixed elixir is what it takes to make a man drunk. So whenever we, we're talking about Ephraim, we're talking about northern Israel is drunk. How did that happen? Well, that's when, that's when Ahab, the king of northern Israel... What Isaiah 28 is talking about is when Hoshea is the king and when they're scattered. And how did all this come into Israel? Through Ahab and Jezebel. When he marries Jezebel, whose father is the, he is the king of Tyre just north of Israel. Here's Israel. And here is Lebanon or Tyre and Sidon. And the king of Tyre was Ethbaal which means with Baal and his daughter Jezebel marries, marries Ahab, king of northern Israel, 
and brings her father's gods, Baal, Grove, etc., which was the same thing as Isis and, and Osiris down here in Egypt and Molech and Molech and Shemash among the Moabites and among the Ammonites. So she brings this down here and they make northern Israel a Roman Catholic state before it's called Roman Catholicism, a Baal and God's and a Baal and Grove state. And that's the drunkenness of Ephraim or northern Israel. And the Bible said it was Samaria, which is northern Israel, that brought all of this paganism. And later on, it married down into southern Judah when Ahab and Jezebel's daughter, Athaliah, marries uh, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. And she brings it down into southern Judah. So they get all corrupted in Israel. And that's why God scatters them. And that's why he has to call the Gentiles by using, by using glossa and dialects. Glossa and dialects. And that's calling the Gentile church. And that's what Peter preached. He preached the resurrection in Acts 2. Now, where was I? Got so many places I'm going. Now let's keep reading. Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. He's talking about spiritual drunkenness. Not a bunch of people in northern Israel getting drunk. That's very foolish to think that. Whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. Ephraim, a northern Israel, is fading. Which are on the head of the fat valleys. Fat, what didn't mean cellulite. This stuff on our side. That's not what it's talking about. The fat of the Jews was the richest. In fact, you remember the word create, bara? In the beginning, God created. The word means to, means to uh, uh, cut and make fat. Make fat. Not make overweight. The fat of the cattle, the fat of the crops was the best of the crops. So when he says the fat valleys, he's talking about the best valleys. And them that are overcome with wine, not literal drinking. Isaiah brings that out in, in Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Isaiah says, Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine. There in verse 22 of chapter 5. Woe to them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink. And then he tells you what he's talking about in verse 23. When you get spiritually drunk, you justify the wicked for reward. That's not a drunk man physically drunk. You justify men of, of high degree so you can get money from them and get a piece of the action. The drunk man can't do that. You justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. That's what spiritual drunkenness does. He's talking about spiritual drunk. I've done many DVDs on spiritual drunkenness. And I go into the making of, of a drunken elixir and what it takes to make the elixir uh, intoxicating. Let's go back to Isaiah 28. Be and he says, Behold the Lord hath, uh, Behold the Lord hath mighty strong one, which as a tempest of hail and destroying storm a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down the earth with the hand. Now he says with an overflowing flood. Now all through the Old Testament, when the Bible speaks of floods, half the time it's talking about not waters of floods, but of an army coming in and destroying someone. Look at Isaiah 8. He'll show you this in Isaiah. Isaiah the 8th chapter. And look here in verse 7. Isaiah is a really interesting book. Isaiah 8. Now, see, verse 7. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon Israel the waters of river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria. He's saying the king of Assyria is a flood, isn't he? That's also going to be the stammering lips that he's going to talk to this people. He says, even the king of Assyria in all his glory, he says, they are a river of waters. Isn't that what it says right there? Uh, I want you to see that. 
waters of a river strong and many, even the king of Assyria and all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. The bank of Assyria was his borders and boundaries up here in the Caucasus. But he's going to come down. He's going to overrun his boundary and come get Israel and carry him away into Syria. This is very abstract terminology. How do you think people would understand this if they think these are rivers? They're not going to understand it, are they? Not at all. Now, you have to think figurative language. We use figurative language all the time, but we don't. My favorite figurative term is, man, that's cool. You know, oh, you mean that's 38 degrees, Jim? No, it's just cool. So, he's overflowing in chapter 28, and I've got all kinds of terms on that. Uh, in Psalms 90 and 5, about Israel being carried away as with a flood. Uh, in Isaiah 59 and 19, in him shall come like a flood. In Jeremiah 46 and 7, Egypt riseth up like a flood. You can get these. Just open up your concordance. You got it in Jeremiah 46 and 8, Jeremiah 47 and 2. You got it in Israel, when they're rebuilding the city and the wall, the end shall be with a flood because they'll be attacked constantly. A flood is armies coming in. That's terminology. That's biblical abstract terminology. Back to Isaiah 28. So this is talking about Assyria coming in to destroy northern Israel, isn't it? In their chariots with other tongues and other languages. And God is going to teach them. They shall cast down the earth and with the hand and the crown of pride. The drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden underfoot by the Assyrians. Not because they all got drunk physically, but because they're worshiping Baal and Grove and they're, they're spiritually drunk and Ahab brought it into northern Israel. And the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower. When you see the fat valleys of the Israelites, what did God say? He said, if you're obedient to me, I'll fill up your valleys full of the fat of the land. But if you, he says, and he said, your storehouses will be full of the wheat in the fat valleys, of all that's in the fat valleys. But when you disobey me, I will send a famine. And that's what he's talking about here. This is the same thing as a famine. He says, the fat valleys will be like a fading flower. He said, you won't have wheat and crops out there. I'll make you be, to be starving. And as the hasty fruit before the summer, before it's ripe, which when he that looketh upon it seeth, while it is yet in his hand, he heedeth it up. In that day when God attacks northern Israel with the Assyrian flood, with the armies of Sennacherib and tiglath pileser when he does that, in that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. There are going to be a few left. God would always have them carry away the rich and the men who were the artificers in, in metals and carry them away, but he would have leave the poor in the land. That's what happened when Jeremiah stayed in the land with the poor. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. The gate of the city was the courthouses of the city. It was the last to go down. It was a very thick area. The gate of a city. Be like so. They traded at the gate of the city. The gate was the last to fall. It wasn't just a gate that opened, but they had sheep. They'd sell sheep at the sheep gate, dung at the dung gate, and they would uh, conduct business inside the gate in here. And when the gates... When the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, that's figurative language for the gate being the strongest part of the wall of a city. Now, let's continue reading. The crown of pride, the, where, no, where was I? Uh, seven. And they also have erred through wine and through strong drink or out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. This is spiritual drunkenness, not literal. 
they, why is he after the priest and the king? Did he always say you kept getting drunk on the job? No, it you kept offering sacrifices to Moloch in Tophet, southeast of Jerusalem. You have to think figurative if you're going to read the Bible and understand it. And look at a lot of other verses, look at a lot of other places when you see flood, look up floods. They that are out of the way through strong Greek, they err in vision, they stumble in judgment. For all the tables are full of vomit and filthiness. This proves to you that it's not talking about literal drunkenness. It's not talking about literal vomit and literal filthiness either. Look over there in Ezekiel 41. Look at Ezekiel 41. Forty-one. He's talking about building the altar right in front of the temple. This is the instructions on the altar. It's part of the instructions. You have the instruction back in Exodus on building the altar, and we'll get into that. But he also repeats it through Scripture that this was the altar. You had two altars in the temple. Here's the precinct of the temple. That's everywhere. This is the precinct of the temple. Like, just like you see it over there. On the, and the, al the altar was here. Brazen sea, the not the veil there, the veil back here, the uh, altar of incense. The altar of incense was made of beaten gold. This was made of of bronze. Some say it was actually copper. Uh, we don't know exactly what it was. Here's the brazen sea, because nobody's seen it or talked to it. All right, now. Now, it's talking about construction of this, and look here in verse 22. The altar of wood was three cubits high, and the length thereof, two cubits, and the corners thereof, and the length thereof, and the walls thereof were of wood. And he said unto them, This is the table that is before the Lord. This was called the table of the Lord. Table. And you know why it was the table? Because the, in the second chapter of 1 Samuel, the priests that were ministering around the altar, which were the Levites, and of course the priesthood were all of the tribe of Aaron, priests, they ministered and they ate when they were on duty from this. They had something called a flesh hook, and they would reach down into the altar there in the second chapter, 1 Samuel, and whatever they pulled up, they ate, and every sacrifice had to be offered with salt, so it didn't taste dull and drab. Well, we're the salt, and we're the sacrifice now. So that was called the table of the Lord. In fact, you can look and get a verification of that in 44 and 16. 44, 16. In 44, 16... They shall enter into my sanctuary and shall come near to my table. This is the priest of God to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge. That's the Levites. And you can look over here in Malachi 1. Malachi 1. Last book of the Old Testament. And I quoted this last week or read it. And he says in verse... In verse uh, Seven, ye offer polluted bread upon mine altar, and you say, now this is an indictment against the priest of Israel. Wherein have we polluted thee, in that ye say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. It's contemptible because of what he says in the next verse. If ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is that not evil? Offer it now to the governor. Will he be pleased? Israel was offering lame, sick lambs to God. They're supposed to be without blemish. That's the picture of Christ, isn't it? They had to thumb through the fur and make sure there's no blemishes. Not only were they blemishes, they were blind, they were lame. It's like I said, you, 
you have a pet lamb and you call it fluffy and they had to march their lambs into the gate of the fold and they'd count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They'd tap them with that rod. Ten. And the tenth one belonged to God. You say, but, but Fluffy got in there and got in the tenth spot and that's my special pet lamb. Let me give you this lame lamb. I'll give you a lamb. He's blind. God said, give the, that to the IRS. See if they'll accept that. See if they'll accept your excuse by saying, well, I'll give you $100 instead of the 5000 I owe you. I just don't think I should have to pay the rest. Tell them that. So that's the table of the Lord. They had polluted God's table. Do you see that? That's what he's talking about. Now back over here to Isaiah. Isaiah 28. 28. Back to verse 8. All, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. He's not talking about the priests who go over there and vomiting on, the, on the, this. He's talking about it's the sickness of a drunk man. He said, the vomit is a lame lamb you put on there. It's vomit to me, God says. It is what the New Testament calls abomination. B-D-E-L-U-G-M-A. Means to stink. He said, that lamb you're offering stinks. And if you offer your body a, a sacrifice and it's lame and it stinks because you're living in the world and living for God at the same time, you're drunk. And then going back over here to the eighth chapter or to the twenty eighth chapter, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. That's why I'm going to send the Assyrians in there to destroy northern Israel. This flood, so that there is no place clean. Whom shall God teach knowledge? He's going to teach Israel, but he's going to have to speak to him with another tongue and another lip. He says, "I'm not going to put up with this." And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. He says, when you mature and grow up and you're acting like children going after these other gods. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is not a precept class with K. Arthur. God's precept are... Assyrians come over and teach my people. Here's a precept on precept. Crack! You will obey me in God's... And they are swords in God's hand. God says, I'll cut you down. That's my precept. You'll hear this. You'll listen to my belt. You ever told that to your kid? You won't listen to me. You'll listen to this. You see, you shouldn't spank your babies. Yes, you should. It will not kill them. I've got something, a lot to say on that. Now, where was I? Precept on precept. For, then he tells you what the precept on precept is. For with stammering lips and another tongue, with the tongues of those Assyrian chariots coming in to slaughter Israel and cut them down. That's what 1 Corinthians 14, God says, I'm going to speak to you with another tongue and another lip. He's equating this with what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 14, isn't he? That's where 1 Corinthians 14 is quoted from. Now let's look on why he does it. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. After I get through talking to you for 2,600 years, you will listen to me. He, doesn't, he just doesn't whip them with the Assyrians. He whipped them with the Assyrians, with the Babylonian belt, with a Persian belt, with a Grecian razor strap, with the, with the axe of the Roman Empire, he just hacked Israel down one time after another. And then they went under all these different nations until May 14, 1948, until the Six-Day War of 1967, June 5th through June 10th, and they, where they got their temple sack back, where they got, is, where they got Jerusalem back. But I believe it'll only be a remnant of those in literal Israel that'll believe, and they're going to have to come through Jesus Christ. No man comes to the Father but by me. They say they worship Jehovah. Jesus was Jehovah. He said, 
I, Jehovah said, tell Moses, tell Israel, I am has sent me. And Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. I am the I am God of the Old Testament. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. They said, you're not 50 years old. You've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And they said, we'll kill you for saying you're God. He said, we won't put up with that. So he was the I am. Now, let's keep reading here. Verse 12, to whom this is the weary wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and we will rest, and we are spiritual Israel, and we are resting in Christ. That's the spiritual Sabbath, isn't it? And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Israel would not hear after being beat up by all of these empires, all these razor straps of God, all these swords of God, they would not hear. With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people. So the tongues were used to preach to the Gentile unbelief, but God put belief in our hearts, didn't he? He didn't put it in their hearts. They stumbled, but not just to stumble. They stumbled so salvation would come to the Gentiles in Romans 11, 11. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. What if I said, what if I said lash upon lash? It's not a nice little pretty precept class. This is talking about one whip after another, one sword after another. That's the precept God, that's the precept class God's got them in. But the word of the Lord was upon them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little bit of beating and there a little bit of beatings. Here a little, there a little. He's not talking about nice little set down class. He's talking about getting a whipping for 2,600 years. And that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And that's what happened to Israel, weren't they? So the tongues has to do with the Assyrians carrying them away, doesn't it? Or to put it this way, the same way God's going to talk to the Assyrians, he's talking to the Gentile church. We have to go through affliction. and through <laughs> Jesus learned through his affliction. He learned righteousness by the things he suffered, and we're going to learn by the things we suffer. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men. The word scornful is a, is a word that means to deride or have contempt for God that rule this people with which is in Jerusalem. So he's talking about Israel, isn't he? And he's talking about him being drunk spiritually. And he's talking about the Assyrians come in and carry him away. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell. Ah, we made a covenant with death and with hell. Well, the hell it's talking about is a figurative language. They made a covenant with Tophet, which was southeast of Jerusalem, and according to Jeremiah the 19th chapter, here's Jerusalem, southeast of Jerusalem was Tophet, and you can see in Isaiah the 30th chapter, and Jeremiah 19, that they're going down to Tophet to offer their children, Israel to offer their children in the fire to Moloch, the sun god of the Ammonites. And they have adopted their God over here in Israel. So they're going down here to offer. And that is compared. They had fires that were never quenched. They kept the fires burning. They were never quenched. Because that's the eternal flame. And that was eventually brought into the Catholic Church. And that's the eternal flame that's at the foot of John Kennedy's grave. And that's why they keep those candle burnings in those churches all the time. So. They, go to, they made a covenant with Tophet to offer their children in the fire. That's why God says he's sending this, this great flood of the Assyrians against them. And then he goes on to say, I mean, which verse? Okay. Before, in verse 15, because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with hell, and, are, and we are in agreement when the overflowing scourge the Assyrian armies was called a S-H-A-Y 
I T Shait S H A Y I T Shait. He says this overflowing scourge, which is a pushing forth with like oars in a sea. He says you're going to be rowing heavy and hard to survive this. He says it's an overflowing scourge shall pass through the land of Israel, and that will be the Assyrian armies. It shall come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge. We found refuge in our fertility gods. These are our lovers, according to Hosea, the second chapter. The gods of Israel were their lovers. That was their drunkenness. He's not talking about literal drunk here. He's talking about spiritual drunk. And under the falsehood have we hid ourselves. You think God's going to let them get by with that? No. He destroyed them for 2,600 years. Therefore thus saith the Lord, God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone. This is a prophecy of Christ, the Messiah. A tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation that he that believed shall not make haste, shall not be eager or he will rest in this. Judgment also will I lay to the lion and righteousness to the plummet. He's saying, I'm going to have a measuring line for judgment. That's called horizo. A plummet line was a plumb line. And you old carpenters, you know what one is. You drop the line, it's got a little, little cone on the bottom of it with a point, and you measure the exact gravitational pull and that's a plumb line God says I'm going to in fact you see that with the man that has the plumb line in his hand in the in the 11th chapter of Revelation you see the man measuring Jerusalem with a plumb line in his hand a plummet a plumb line in his hand over there in Zechariah the second chapter and God says I'm going to measure my city and it'll be holy inside that holy and pro horizo is the word predestinate horizo is our word horizon. It means a boundary line of light. So God says, I'm going to measure my Jerusalem. It'll be holy. Now where, which verse was I in? 18. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled after 2,600 years of line upon line, precept on precept, with men of other tongues will I speak unto this people. Israel and my Israel will hear me and I'll measure with a plumb line all those who are inside my horizo, my predestinated elect family. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled and your agreement with hell shall not stand. This agreement of offering your children to this so-called fertility god, Moloch or Shemosh or Baal or Grove, they were all fertility gods. God, Jehovah God is the fertility God. I'll fill up your storehouses. Isn't that fertility? I'll fill up your fields. That's fertility there in the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. I'll do that. And God says, you've given all of these gods credit for the oil and the wine and the corn that I gave you. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then you shall be trodden down by it. You'll be trodden down by the overflowing scourge, which is the same thing as the flood in the earlier part of the chapter. Can you see that? The flood and the overflowing scourge is the Assyrian armies. This is God's language of speaking to Israel. This is the way they spoke. From the time that it goeth forth, it shall take you, for morning by morning shall it pass over. One day after the other, by day and by night, the Assyrians are coming. And southern Judah was warned about Babylon coming. And it shall be a vexation only to understand the report, something heard or an announcement. For the bed is shorter than that man can stretch himself on it. You're not going to be able to sleep in this bed. You've heard the old saying, you made your bed and I sleep in it. Your legs are too long to sleep in this bed. You're not going to like this. See, that saying, all these sayings go back a long way. And the covering narrower than he can wrap himself in it. Nothing's going to protect you when I'm through. You can't lay in this bed and make it. 
For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. This is a strange act. God's going to destroy his own people. That's very strange, isn't it? He's called them from the beginning, and he says, now I'm going to destroy you and call my people by another name, Gentile church. That's over there in Isaiah, the 65th chapter. Now, therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your hands be made strong, for I have heard from the Lord God of hosts a consumption. That word, kalal, K-A-L-A-H, complete destruction. That don't sound like just drinking beer, does it? Me and Mary saw the funniest thing yesterday. It just reminded me. We was at this restaurant off down in Jolton. And these two men come in. They sit down. And the waiter said, how about a cold beer? Yeah, a cold beer sounds good. And they sit down and get drink, start drinking their beer. And then they brought their hamburgers. And they said, let's pray. <laughs> Mary, said, Mary said, is that an oxymoron? I said, I guess it is. I, I, go figure, as the kids say. Now. The total destruction ev even determined upon the whole earth. Give ye ear and hear my voice, hearken and hear my speech. Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin? The seed of God is going to be scattered all over the earth by a farmer named tiglath Pileser by a farmer named Sennacherib. He's going to take the seed of God. This is amazing to me. He's going to start, it's like, and then later on in 586, Nebuchadnezzar is God's farmer. He's going to put his seed back on, bag on, and he's going to put Israel as God's seed in the bag and scatter them all over the world. It's like it was a righteous act of God. Their fall was a righteous act, so all these Gentiles would be physical know Israel, and they would become spiritual Israel. You say, that's hard to get a hold of. It's hard for me to get a hold of, but that's what God did. So he says, these men that scatter Israel, he says, they're like the cumin and cast into the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place, in their place. Boy, that's... A God has a place to scatter his seed so the later on in Acts 2, they'll come back from all over the world and they'll be hearing this. They'll come back here and they've been in their place. Each one of these Jews, these were Jews only in Acts 2, but they'd been scattered in their place. In their place means they've got a place to be over here in Greece so that when they meet here in Acts 2, they'll go back to Thessalonica and preach to some of these Gentiles because they are in their place in order to preach to God's predestinated elect Gentiles. You understand? Do you realize how much strength there is in that phrase, in their place? That's a powerful statement. He's going to scatter Israel to a place where they're supposed to be so when Acts 2 gets here and they're going back to these festivals, they're going to go back and take the word of God to Gentile elect people. Those people are not accidentally. God had to perform every act of passion between men and woman among those Jews to have it to be who they are so they could have the babies that they had by the generation of Acts 2 to take the gospel back to everyone who was in their place. That's a sovereign God. Can you get a hold of that? You understand what I'm saying? They're in their place. Whew. Man. In their place. Boy, I love that phrase. That ought to just make you humble. Like, oh me. For his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him how. 
line upon line, precept over precept, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, plus all the other nations that ruled them. The last people that ruled them in a military fashion was the Turks. They were liberated in 1970, put into a peaceful uh, resolution with the Great Britain as a province of Great Britain, and they were peaceful, but Great Britain could not, under that Balfour Declaration, could not keep them at peace. So when that Balfour Declaration expires, May 14, 1948, the pressure's been put upon all the world by Harry Truman, who is a hero to the Jewish people. To declare, he learned something in his old Southern Baptist Sunday school class out in Independence, Missouri, that these were a special people. So he pressures the world to declare them a nation. He even told Libya, I will, I will, I will cut off all aid to you if you don't vote for them. Libya voted for, the, for Israel to be a nation at the National Council of Tel Aviv, 1948, May 14. They became a nation. I don't know how in the world I got into all that. But anyway, he says... The fishes are not are threshed, threshed with the threshing instrument, neither is the cart wheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fishes are beaten out with a rod and the cumin with a rod, and the rod is God's rod, and that is God's going to, he tells Israel, though you keep not my commandments nor my statutes, then the 89th Psalm, he says, I will not break my covenant with you, I'll visit your transgression with the rod. He's talking about the rod is the Assyrians in this case, and then the rod will be Babylon, and the rod will be passed just like a, just like you're in a relay race. You're passing that baton. Okay, I beat them. Here, Babylonians, take it and beat them. Here, Persians, now you beat them. And that's line upon line, precept upon precept. Bread corn is bruised because he will never, he will not ever be threshed, threshing it nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. This also cometh forth from the Lord. Listen, look at that verse. This also cometh from the Lord of hosts. People say, God won't make anybody sick. God won't hurt anybody. He says, I'm going to kill Israel by the millions. And it'll be by the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in all this working he's going to do. This is God's work to crush Israel. Now let's go back to 1 Corinthians. Can you get a... But it's just all about with men of other tongues, with men of stammering lips and another tongue, will I speak to this people? Right? Can you see that 28th chapter? If you don't think in a figure, you would have any idea what that chapter is about, would you? Without figurative language. You have to think abstract. I, I, I don't understand people that think all this is literal. It's like trying to I was looking at something here. Yeah, let me let me read this definition of abstract to you. It means thought of apart from any particular instance or material object, not concrete. Concrete is table, piano, something you touch, board. Abstract is a thought of part, not of any particular thing. If you think baptism is water, what are you going to do when Jesus says to James and John, can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with tomorrow when I die on a cross? You think they're going to dip him in water just before they put him on a cross? No. <clears throat> baptism, a blood baptism was a death. If you don't think figuratively there, you're just messing it. Now let's go back over to 1 Corinthians 14. See if we can kind of Wind up this chapter, and we're not going to be able to because I got too much on the rest of it. All right, First Corinthians fourteen. So now we understand when he says, "Wherefore he says with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people?" Because it's written in the law in Isaiah twenty-eight, and I'm going to talk to them with the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks. And yet for all this, they will not hear me. And they never did hear, so God blinded their eyes. When he comes into Jerusalem, Jesus blinds them when he says, If thou hast not even thou on this thy day the things that belong to thy peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes, I blind you today. And I'm going to call my Gentile church. 
and I'm going to use the gloss and the dialects to do it with. They were the unbelievers. Wherefore tongues are for a sign. A simeon. Simeon is the word sign. I've got something here I want to give to you. Let me just show you something that will kind of really interesting. Tongues are a sign, not to them that believe, but them that believe not. But prophesying or preaching the word of God serves not for them that believe not, but it's for those that believe. The reason I'm preaching the word of God this morning is for you. You're the believers. It's instructing you in understanding truth. That's what prophetia means. It means to speak the word of God. So if tongues are for a sign to them that believe not, tongues equals them that believe not, them that believe not. And sign, Simeon, means a flag, a signal. It means a beacon. If you got this thing, looks like this. Got this light shining out here, and it's going. Got these rocks down here. That is a simeon, and that's a lighthouse. And what is that lighthouse saying? It is saying, huh? it's saying, ship, don't get close to me. There's rocks here, and there's land here. Stay away. It's a simeon. If you've got, if you've got these tracks, you've got this thing here, and you've got this, got this thing that looks like that X there, and it's got these lights up here, and it's got this little thing that comes down and goes and you hear this, you see those lights flashing. You hear this thing going, ding, 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 ding. What is that? That's a simeon. That's a flag. That's saying, there's this train coming. Stay back. If you see a sign, it says Firestone. That's a pointer. It says there is, there's tires down here for sale. This says there's a train down here coming. It's pointing. It's a pointer. This points to the ships and say there's some rocks down here. This is all a simeon. It's what it is. It's a flag. It's a beacon. It's a signal. That's what the tongues are. They are a signal to them that believe not. When these men come in and they're ignorant fishermen from northern Galilee, it wouldn't be such a miracle if they were all brilliantly educated and they all had 12 or 14 gloss and dialects. It wouldn't have been so impressive that they were of God, would it? When they come in, they're common men. They're speaking these, they're speaking in a, in a glossa, and it's going to the people in their ear in the dialect that they're hearing, how hear we every man in our own dialect, in the country wherein we were born. That's what he, they're saying there in Acts 2. Now, he's, let me show you something that's really interesting, which is not really any different. The Old Testament word is the word oath. It means a flag, a signal, a beacon. It's the same word as Simeon in the New has the same definition it's the word token or sign in the Old Testament. The common word token, the common word sign is the word oath. In fact, look at Genesis, the 17th chapter. How much time do I have? Huh? Out of time. Gosh, I thought I had 20 or 30 minutes left. How long have I been over it? Five minutes. I'll come back next week and show you this. You'll find that circumcision was a sign and that the Sabbath was a sign. But the Sabbath is resting in Christ. That means you've died to self and you've resurrected. 
when you rest in the spiritual Sabbath. Doesn't that mean that? So the Sabbath is still the sa there as a sign in circumcision is the cutting off of the sin of the heart. You see that? Therefore, circumcision, spiritual circumcision, and spiritual Sabbath is the same thing as resurrection because you have to die to self and be resurrected in Christ to be enjoying the spiritual Sabbath. And they were signs in the Old Testament. So they would also be a sign in the New. You see what I'm saying? You can find that the token uh, being the sign in the Old in, in Galatians 15, and you can find the Sabbath being a sign in Exodus 31, 13 through 17. It's, it's all spiritual. Well, I was just interested in getting further into this. It just seems like I preached about 30 minutes this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for truth. Cause us to continue your work. Lead us to your elect, Lord, and open up the door for the ministry. We'll keep preaching it. I pray for those that work in the ministry, for Mary and Dave and Tom and Mike and, and Judy and everybody else that's working to hit, keep this going, for Victor and all those that run the cameras. Lord, keep, keep encouraging them to continue for Ellie and for everyone that's a part of this ministry. We pray that you'll cause them to continue. Cause the flock to grow. Cause them to be convicted about supporting the ministry that we have so many things to do and so many people to reach. Lord, we'll give you praise for everything. In Christ's name, amen. I wasn't through. So then, on this 11th verse, we can say, For with the Assyrian army will God That's right. To That's exactly right. So the Assyrian army was the same thing as Paul talking about whatever God has to use to talk to the Gentile unbelievers. Yeah, that's exactly what he's saying.